So hello everyone, thank you all for joining us today in the second episode of this webinar series on breakthroughs in fusion research and development. For those who missed the first episode, I'll put the link of the recording on the chat. So many thanks to our speakers for today, Jensen Hu, Thomas Sam Pedersen and Ian Chapman for accepting our invitation to this event. I'm Matteo Barbarino from, for the International Atomic Energy Agency. This webinar gives an overview of the most recent groundbreaking results in fusion R&D to understand how such progress brings fusion energy closer to realization. Today's episode features the East Tokamak, the Windows 7x Stellarator, and the Must Upgrade Spherical Tokamak. As you probably know, on December 30, 2021, China's Experimental Advanced Superconducting Tokamak, or EAST, achieved stable 1056 seconds steady state high temperature plasma operation setting a record long pulse operation. Windows 7x is the world's most advanced stellarator and has been operating since 2015 in Germany. In these years, a number of breakthroughs have been achieved and more are expected in the upcoming operation phase. And the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority's new MassTU experiment has demonstrated the effectiveness of an innovative heat exhaust system known as SuperX Diverter. We're going to hear about these three facilities and their exceptional results. The format will be a sequence of three talks, 30 minutes each. Please type your questions and comments into the chat box. We will go through the, your questions during the 30 minutes Q&A at the end. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Johnson Hu, Deputy Director General, Institute of Plasma Physics, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Okay, thank you, Chairman. I share my screen. Yes, thank you. Okay, this is okay for you? Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to give a talk on the East Tokamak achieves a record longer pass operation in thousand second square on the behalf of East team and the computers. Oh, sorry. So first I would like uh, thank you all computers from the world contributed to East uh, machine and uh, the plasma operations and so on. Okay, this is the outline for this talk, and I, this is four part. First, the, the challenges for long pass steady state operation. So, long pass operation is essential for future fusion reactor, a uh, steady state tokamak fusion reactor should be sustained fusion energy and output for sufficient longer time, and. It's, this plus, uh, fusion power is uh, <coughs> dependent on the fuel product and the boiling time. For superconducting to max, no resi resistance in coils can be operated for long pass. Ether is also where we operate in long pass. Uh, So at this moment, development of superconducting tokamaks in world where is include IG7, East, Kista, West, GT SA, and also as GT1, also include ITER. In the near future, EU demo CIVTR Spark also will be designed as a for superconducting facilities. High temperature superconductor has attracted more attention for the Subconducting tokamaks. So this is the key issues and challenges for longer pass operations. First is plasma control and high time performance maintenance in long time scale. And the second is heating and current driver for non-inductive steady state operation. The third one is plasma wall interaction and its long time control. This includes recycling and particle exhaust Diverter heat lot and the power exhaust, impurity screen and the control. The last one is the core edge integration for the reactors. It should be in, um, 
integrated of different uh, multi time scale physical process. So this uh, second, I will introduce the key technology development for standard operation on East. East so the, so the conducting to mark is have it like configurations, double no, upper signal and low signal. And the major radio is about 1.7 to 1.85 meters and uh, the magnetic field is about 3.5 Tesla. Its main target is to get that's it, for example, 1,000 second operation with uh, about 20 to 30 megawatts uh, current <coughs> heating and current driver power and is extensive advanced technologies. My mission is to play the key role for understanding advanced uh, sensitive plasma physics and provide valuable data based basis for ETA and demo and under the same condition. So for uh, ETA have a longer three stage for longer pass operation. The first stage is enhanced uh, heating and current driver actions and the relevant fun fundamental physical understanding and the key technology, to the key diagnostics. And the second step is to de demonstrate longer pass more than 100 second edge mode plasma and develop for non inductive uh, high beta scenarios. This is uh, the first and the second step are almost finished, and the, now is the third step. In this third step, we would like want to extend its operation of regime to demonstrate that state high performance plasmas and deliver relevant physicals for future reactors. And in the last uh, year, East have make uh, a big uh, upgrade. And we <coughs> improve the heat flux cap cap capability for lower diameter and higher spectral and temper temporal resolution for uh, diagnostics. And for the heating and the current driver system, <coughs> we arranged the, uh, the pods for different uh, heating system and uh, to improve the coupling and the injected power, and also improve the uh, gas limiters, the heat flux, and remove capability. For the other system, we also improve the capacity of the cooling, water cooling system, and also upgrade cryogenic and the pump systems. <clears throat> and for the my machine uh, safety, we uh, we change the current leaders for the robust uh, uh, operation. This is the four tanks and tavator with the higher heat load remove capability. We use the uh, either like tanks and cover structure to remove the uh, graphite uh, tavator and the heat flux Exhaust capabilities increase from 2 megawatts per square meter to 10 megawatts per square meter. And for some, for the flat tap uh, uh, tank director, the sample successfully tested within with the uh, uh, heat flux remove uh, capacity to 20 megawatt per square meter. So this is the uh, the machine. Uh, in 2014, we insert it like upper tank divider. So in the last year, we insert upgrade to the lower tank divider. So now, East have, um, have become a four meter walls. So on East, we use the very higher efficiency work condition, include iron uh, SF cleaning a uh, routing intensive lithium work condition coating and also use lithium injection during the plasma operation. This is greatly reduce the impurities, reduce power radiation loss and suppress uh, recycling for good density control and also control the hydrogen uh, content in deuterium plasma to lower than 10% for the SF heating. This is 
increase the plasma stability and confinement. And we use a good dense, density control and particle exhaust, high pump speed working, and including the weather in weather fair pumps. This is about 210 cubometer per second for deuterium. <coughs> we use the subsonic molecular beam injection and the pellet injection for the core filling. And we develop a variable heating and current drive system. On east, we use ARGCD, SF, ECH, and uh, uh, MBI. Totally, the source power is about 33 megawatts. In the last year, we arranged the, um, the pots for different uh, heat system and reduced the merger interface in the forest between the ARGCD and the SF heating. And uh, we also, um, um, we also <coughs> modified the SF antenna using the lower um, wave number about uh, seven per meter. And also ECH, we added a new CPI electron in the last year. So totally for the ECH power can be around for two seconds, 200 seconds at uh, 1.4 megawatt. So this is a heating and current driver for longer operation. So the <clears throat> Jetron ECH operation at with active cooling stable launch. ARGCD system with dedicated antennas and gas limiter and double circle control to optimize the driving power automatic restart control for Jetron and uh, transmission. Plasma loop voltage control using 4.6 GHz LHCD with optimized PID control in PCS. So on East, we developed a lot of uh, diagnostics with, with, with the highest spatial and temporal resolutions. About eight, 80 diagnostics have been installed. In the last year, 10 more uh, new diagnostics developed, and this include MSE diagnostics for uh, current profile control and uh, the air camera with large coverage. And the key technology diagnostics for long pass operation include Thomson scaling, parameter interferometer, motional stack effect diagnostics and also less or collective scattering diagnostics. We also develop very stable plasma equilibrium uh, magnetic control. First is a fiber optic current sensors, 5D uh, effect with no signal drift and the plasma and the PF coils current measurement for plasma control is very good. And the second is a very low zero drift integrator for longer plasma operation. The drift is lower than 200 megawatts uh, second for, for, the, for 100 second plasma operation. Linear drift dedication <laughs> algorithm in PCS. And uh, we use G GPU per Parallel equilibrium reconstruction. This uh, can be um, have 100 times the uh, computational acceleration efficiency, and the streamlined P if it routinely provides real time magnetic equilibrium parameters. Now I give the talk uh, introduction of the achievements on 1000 second square plus mass. In the last 15 years, long plasma operation have been successfully extended in on East. And uh, this is given some milestone. And in 2010, we get the first edge mode. And in 2012, we get 30 second edge mode, 400 
and second air mode. In 2016, we get 60 second edge mode, and uh, in uh, 2070, we get uh, 17, we get uh, 100 second edge mode. In the last year, we get uh, more than 100 with a high temperature, about uh, 12 kV, and uh, uh, that's the operation, more than 1,000 seconds. So this is the for now in inductive driving edge mode up to 100 seconds. And where is more smell, EIDB was found, and the confinement edge uh, 98 is larger than 1.15, and is the four, uh, four, <coughs> cal um, four half, Current uh, driver and heating and zero moment to input tanks divider with effective control of heat and impurities. The tanks impurities are very low, and the maximum the PFC temperature is lower than uh, 600 degrees C, and the plasma density with well controlled with lower uh, recycling about uh, at uh, about uh, 0 0.9, and with also get the four nine inductive driven high beta value up to 60 seconds. This short high beta P is about uh, 2.2, 2.1. And uh, we extend the, of the four nine inductive high beta scenarios. The beta P uh, was uh, increased step by step in the last uh, few years and uh, the, 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 the highest beta P can reach to about three, and the extended operation regimes, and for example, high density, and uh, the poultry for the um, ratio is about 50%, uh, and this was achieved dominant E electron heating and zero uh, torque. And uh, with um, small armies with where impurities controls was found and improved confinement the highest, uh, the IG98 is about uh, 1.4, and the EIDB inside the um, um, radio lower than, of the um, smaller than 0.4. Okay, so uh, in the last few years, we try a lot of uh, effort, efforts to to get uh, to to achieve the long pass uh, operation with higher uh, electrical temperatures. From 2018, we get the, uh, the, the plasma with the, the electron temperature higher than 8.6 keV. And to, in the last year, we get the uh, electron temperature then, um, higher than 10 kV uh, um, sustained for 101 seconds. And we get the, um, the electron temperature higher than 6 kV and sustained more than 1,000 seconds. Okay, for this uh, uh, higher temperature uh, operation, and this short in the Uh, sorry, we don't hear you anymore. Okay, just a second. No, there's no audio. I don't know if you changed something with the settings, but the audio just disappeared. I see the microphone, the microphone is on, but we don't hear you.
now now is okay yes thank you we just lost it when when you when you went on this slide so you can restart from here thank you okay i don't know why but uh, i have not unmuted so this uh for this um for this is okay sorry at the moment i don't know why Okay, this is, uh, in this short we we found the reduction of the core turbulence by multi scale instabilities in the action with the MHD. And uh, we found in in intri intrinsic turbulence turbulent current in high um, electron temperature with uh, 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 EADB and turbulence current in current current direction and self uh, regu Relation system of turbulence and uh, turbulence current was found exciting and uh, uh, control of the one one mode using 4.6 GHz LHCD was also found. And this uh, one, one one mode sustains the dead state longer pass with a high beta, beta EO. So for this shot, the temperature on the director is less than 300 degrees C. And as you can find this is very stable and the, uh, is very good, uh, was very controlled. Okay, now it's uh, uh, 1,056 1, second long plus, uh, plasma with four metal walls in the last year. And this is also for fully non-inductive plasma with dominant electric heating and zero injected torque. And the injection power is 1.65 megawatts and totally the injected energy is 1.73 GJR. And the confinement H H9 is about 1.3, and the the slip in the plasma equilibrium configuration is well a good uh, controlled, and uh, the particles recycling and the lot also was con good controlled. And uh, so this is uh, shows the the. the Density and the electron temperature profiles for this mode, and this is the I mode, and uh, the uh, the center temperature is quite high, but the the density is not uh, is is not so high. So this is the typical I mode, and uh, in this shot, uh, the RF current driver is about seventy uh, percent, uh, and the for trip uh, is about thirty percent. So this is a higher LGCD efficiency due to the higher and the, the wave frequency and the lower recycling. And this is driving the current to extend the discharge to longer duration that can be mentioned to the by the car central solenoid. Okay, this is a shot is also a new high confinement and self-organizing regimes. This is a super I mode. This means this is the I mode and plus the uh, EIDB under the double no uh, configuration with ETRO and uh, WCM. And the beta P is about uh, 1.5. And the marginally and balanced at the boundary and plasma parameters and of the turbulence transition, self organized circle may be the key mechanism to sustain stationary super I mode. In the action between the MHD turbulence and the electron heat transport for the uh, sustain the sensitive IDB. So this is very good for the this long plasma charge. Okay, this is also uh, uh, very good confinement with uh, so this is EIDB with no detectable turbulence and turbulence rise in lower 
collision and lower torque and uh, uh, electron heating plasma. And we also use in these pictures uh, to move the, the, the point to, the, to, to more than one at this position. And also we found the stem stage one one mode plays a key physical role in this discharge, reduce the, the turbulence level, active control the, uh, by the low voltage. Okay, this uh, shows the robust plasma control in this shots and a very good uh, shape control using new fiber optic current sensors and very low zero, zero drift integrator for long parts with linear drift detection uh, argon theorem in PCS. And this uh, low voltage control is very good and for this uh, non-inductive current drive. So for the uh, heat flux uh, exhaust, this is uh, significantly enhanced by the water cooled diverter. And the new tension lower diverter with very higher uh, heat removal capacity and uh, make the little the temperature was controlled uh, where is lower than 500 degrees C. And the advanced uh, double diverter configuration helps to reduce the target heat flux, maintaining the temperature of the components in connect with the plasma on the control. Much lower um, tension sparkling rate leads to the lower tension source from the diverter. Okay, this uh, shows the uh, inbuilt behavior in this shot, and uh, you can find the the the, the uh, low the impurities is very stable, and the tension uh, con concentration is estimated to be uh, five or six uh, minus five. And, and the frequent sputtering of the metal leak impurities sometimes occurred from uh, time at the 700 seconds, which does not, does not, did not impact the, this discharge. And the particle recycling was also very good uh, controlled, optimized optim um, configuration for this good particle control and also very higher efficiency fueling by SMBI and thermal proofing was was used and enhanced particle exhaust due to the enlarged uh, diverter slot uh, for the pumping and enhanced the well pumping by real time lithium injection during this discharge. Okay, I give the summary of the and the future plan. Uh, key technologies for this operation have been developed on uh, East, including high performance diverters, robust plasma control, SMBI feedback fueling, particle pumping, work conditioning, continuous heating and current drive. Also include uh, also high resolution diagnostics. We are integrated control on plasma configurations, equilibrium, Heating and current driver, heat flux, particle exhaust, impurities, and recycling have been well uh, integrated for extension of this uh, longer plasma discharge. East achieved this uh, first uh, tokamak operation within a past last in thousand second uh, scale with the plasma temperature in the tens of million degrees Kelsey. And the self driving current is where we, as the first, first thing for the liter Q larger than five, longer pass, and assess the operation. In the future, we will try um, uh, to, um, we are deploying, is deploying, assess the plasma with high uh, density, high temperature, include uh, uh, iron temperature, edge mode in longer plasma discharge in support of ITER and CVT and future uh, reactors towards the... So this, uh, we will de uh, continue development of additional key technologies, including the 
Grass Army Free Discharge, Stable Detachment Edge Mode, Long Pass, Quest for Snowflake, uh, Discharge, and so on. And also use uh, upgrade the MBI and SF for iron heating and use more ECH for current and Q profile control and also develop effective and uh, develop effective core age modeling and prediction. Okay, this is all. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Jen Zeng, for sharing with us your exceptional results. Uh, as announced, we'll uh, please type your questions on the chat and we'll take them at the end of the q and I see that uh, some of you are indeed uh, already doing that. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, now, please uh, welcome Professor Thomas Sam Pedersen, head of the Stellarator Edge and Director of Physics at the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics in Germany. And thank you very much, Matteo, for the invitation. Um, and let me share my screen. Oop, excuse me. Right. Um, so it gives me real pleasure to talk about the key results from the W7X Stellarator and uh, a little bit about a vision for a Stellarator power plant based based on, on the results that you'll be seeing. Uh, <clears throat> giving this behalf on the in, entire W7X team, uh, which is uh, truly multi multinational. So here's my overview. Uh, I'll talk about Stellarators and their main features. I'll introduce you to the W7X Stellarator, its goals, its size, its scope, and a bit about the timeline. Uh, and then I'll give you some of our highlights uh, from recent operation, talk about near-term plans, and at the end, uh, close up with a vision for a Stellarator power plant based on, on uh, W7X. And then I'll summarize. So, um, to introduce the Stellarator, I'd like to compare it to the Tokamak. Um, they have a lot of similarities. It's the same um, topology for the magnetic field, nested flux surfaces, a combination of toroidal and poloidal magnetic field giving, giving the twist of the field lines, uh, but they're created in, in different ways. Also, uh, the Tokamak, as you just saw, um, very impressive uh, results from, uh, from East. Uh, many large experiments uh, exist uh, in the tokamak realm, whereas only a few large experiments uh, have been put into operation to date. Uh, tokamaks have already achieved good plasma confinement um, in terms of energy confinement time, and also at high temperatures and densities, so high triple products have been achieved. And at, uh, for the Stellarator, uh, it is necessary to use computer optimization to maintain a good plasma energy confinement time at high temperature. Density is, a, in some sense, a free parameter that you can you can uh, increase quite uh, quite a lot in the in the stellarator. Uh, one drawback of the way the uh, twist and poloidal field is created in a tokamak, um, namely that it has a very strong um, a toroidal current that creates the poloidal field um, is that instabilities may damage the vessel walls significantly. And we saw before that you can actually operate for very long times, but um, you also saw that this was as a relatively low uh, plasma current. Um, the advantage of the stellarator is that it is uh, more stable in this regard. Runaway electrons are not a concern. You can think of it as a rigid prescribed cage uh, created by the coils uh, without the need for uh, large uh, plasma currents. If you want to operate the steady, uh, the, the tokamak in steady state, you must, <clears throat> at the reactor scale, you must dedicate several hundreds of megawatt um, to uh, the current drive. Uh, so they will be recirculating back into the plasma, uh, lowering the plant efficiency. And this is, um, not the case uh, in the stellarator because we don't we need the current drive. Uh, it is intrinsically steady state. And hence, um, as a reactor, it will have low recirculating power. So there are uh, reasons why we uh, are pursuing this approach, uh, even though it requires a, a complicated uh, computer optimization and has a more complicated geometry. 
Another advantage uh, that I uh, just touched upon is that uh, much higher densities are possible in uh, a stellarator than in the equivalent uh, tokamak. And this allows uh, a reactor to operate and burn at a lower temperature and still uh, get the same uh, amount of power out as the equivalent tokamak. And this has lots of advantages uh, in particular for the plasma wall interaction. <clears throat> Let me illustrate the importance of stellarator optimization by showing you a classical stellarator, a previous generation um, stellarator less optimized than the latest. And first, I've launched a particle uh, with a lot of parallel kinetic energy, which uh, passed e easily uh, through high field regions shown in red. And now uh, and it was well confined uh, because of the flux surfaces and the uh, rotational transform. Uh, what I showed here now was uh, the same particle, but just launched with a lot of perpendicular kinetic energy so that it's magnetically trapped. And if uh, the, the stellarator has not been carefully optimized, uh, such particles uh, can tend to uh, leave the device because of the grad V and curvature drifts illustrated down here. The tokamak, of course, also has um, Trap particles, um, as well as passing particles, the trap particles uh, are well confined because of the symmetry of the tokamak, whereas you need to apply essentially a hidden symmetry hidden, uh, not so obvious to the naked eye optimization of this. This uh, or orbit is just going to continue and be well confined. So let me start orbits in W 7 X. First, you see a particle launched uh, with a lot of parallel kinetic energy passing through the high field and low field regions and tracing out uh, a magnetic field line um, very closely. Uh, so let's go to the trapped particles, which are the more complicated ones uh, to confine. Uh, this is a deeply trapped particle. Uh, and as you can see, uh, with the optimization of W7X, uh, the grad B and curvature drifts uh, Give you a poloidal precession that actually closes the the the, uh, the orbits. So optimization, and there are many different flavors of op optimization one can pursue in stellarators, is uh, a necessity uh, to avoid uh, prompt orbit losses. And um, by that, uh, uh, new classical uh, transport losses, which uh, could be quite detrimental, and would dominate at the reactor scale to the point of um, making it difficult to ignite. So W7X's goal is to experimentally verify the reactor relevance of these optimized stellarators, and its status is that it has completed three operation phases since 2015. Its major radius is five and a half meters. The minor radius is half a meter, uh, so that across the plasma here is, is one meter, and the plasma volume is 30 cubic uh, meters. It, imply, uh, it uses superconducting coils uh, that allow a magnetic field of 2.5 Tesla uh, inside plasma. Uh, you see them appearing here uh, in the CAD drawing. And as I just showed you, it has been optimized um, to give uh, good energy confinement by reducing the uh, neoclassical particle orbit losses, as mentioned. It's also been optimized so that it should uh, have stability and a, a good equilibrium at uh, relatively high plasma pressures, a volume average betas of up to 5%. <clears throat> it has uh, furthermore been optimized to have an efficient power and particle exhaust solution using the island diverter concept, which I will introduce. Uh, and in fact, it's been optimized for more things, um, but these are particularly relevant. And uh, several of these I will uh, show proof of um, uh, that these, this optimization has, uh, in fact, been possible and successful. I'm going to close uh, up the uh, cryostat and the cat drawing here um, so that I can transition to a picture taken uh, during construction. Obviously, uh, we have been in operation since 2015, so this predates that, uh, but it's a nice picture that's showing the, the size of a person and uh, you can look into the cryostat and also see the, um, the plasma vessel uh, inside of that. Steady state operation will start in 2022, aiming in steps to go all the way up to 18 gigajoule per pulse. 
for example, that would be 30 minutes at 10 megawatt of heating power. Uh, here, are, here is a summary of highlighted results. We have built the stellarator confinement cage, the magnetic flux surfaces, and, and verified them with flux surface mapping with high precision, better than one in 100,000. Uh, we've verified the strong reduction of plasma generated parallel currents, uh, basically the bootstrap current. Um, and this improves stability and assists uh, efficient exhaust using the island diverter um, concept. And um, our latest uh, uh, result came out in Nature about a year ago now, um, proving that the orbit optimization works. In fact, uh, by do and the proof is that the confinement is so good also at high ion temperature that it would not have been possible in any previous stellarator. And I will uh, show you how that argument goes uh, here. Uh, high performance discharges uh, give us uh, the chance of proving this statement I just made that the neoclassical optimization is um, successful. Given the measured density and temperature profiles of uh, this discharge um, that was used in, in um, the Nature paper, the neoclassical transport can be calculated with high confidence uh, given that it is a, a single particle orbit combined with binary collisions, um, something that is quite tractable uh, numerically. Um, our best performance has uh, been with pellet fuel discharges. Um, so this one is also a pellet fuel discharge um, with some density peaking, which is important for uh, some reduction of turbulence. And uh, this one applied central ECRH heating of 4.5 megawatts um, and uh, achieved an energy confinement time of 230 milliseconds, 0.23 seconds. And most of the transport is actually due to turbulence. Uh, it uh, is about 70% of the uh, of the heat flux. Uh, it's the turbulent transport drives 70% of the heat flux at mid radius, um, and even more so at other radii. And you see that here, where we have calculated in, calculated the neoclassical electron and ion losses, and added them up, and you can see that only 30% of uh, the heat leaving the plasma at the mid radius is uh, by these neoclassical uh, loss mechanisms. So the rest um, is presumably turbulence and of course, radiative losses, uh, which play a subdominant role. Um, and outside of that uh, peak, uh, it's even more dominated. Um, you can see the temperatures um, are, are in the uh, 2.5 to 3 kV range and the density is um, at 1.1 uh, 1.0 times 10 to the 20. That itself is not proof of optimization. That, that proof comes here by comparing to earlier generation stellarator configurations. We can calculate the equivalent neoclassical losses in less optimized configurations by assuming the same density and temperature profiles and to make a one-to-one a, um, -one comparison, so to speak, we have scaled them to the plasma volume of W7X and the magnetic field strength of W7X. And the result is that there are much higher neoclassical losses in these previous uh, generation uh, stellarator designs, larger than the applied heating power uh, was, uh, in the W7X discharge we just showed. In other words, uh, they wouldn't have been uh, possible, those profiles, uh, that, uh, that confinement time would not have been possible without the optimization. In W7X, as you just show, uh, saw, um, uh, the neoclassical losses only amount to about a third, and this is at the peak, whereas in LHD, uh, it would have exceeded uh, the, the total heating power, uh, the heat flux uh, leaving, leaving the plasma at, at mid radius going out to further radii would exceed it. And that same uh, would be true for W7AS, which was already somewhat optimized. And this one is also has some op, uh, optimization, but not to the point of W7X. And TJ2, uh, a pre, uh, one more generation back, um, would have uh, been, been very far from uh, being able to reach these results. So that's the proof uh, that the optimization actually uh, works and matters and can be measured. Let me move on to the island diverter, which is uh, a highly advantageous exhaust concept. Uh, the 
The principle is that we're using an island chain um, at the edge of the plasma to create the indirect uh, contact and uh, X points uh, for the exhaust. And it works um, similar to a tokamak in many ways, just has many X points and this island chain uh, works as, as a buffer region. Uh, you have the heat flux going out of the plasma core, going into the island um, along the field uh, to the target plates and also across an X point here to the outside of the island, also following field lines uh, here. Because all, of course, all of this is three dimensional. The island chains um, are three dimensional and these uh, diverter units, which, which hug the plasma in the bean shaped cross section, the thin cross section uh, are obviously also three dimensionally shaped. And you can see that there, there is evidence of, of a, a long interaction region uh, here. This is also clear in um, infrared images that allow us to measure the heat flux in, in operation. And the heat flux patterns are very much as expected. We did find uh, some discrepancies, uh, which we in the meanwhile have been able to reconcile uh, with, uh, with the codes. Um, so these were minor, but they were important to find to to realize um, that one needs to add a little bit more physics to the to the code to to get everything right. Uh, so th so this is during attached operation uh, where we have seen um, he uh, heat fluxes which are uh, compatible with uh, operation uh, of the uh, future uh, W seven X water cooled diverter, um, but um, are somewhat intense. But it gets better. Um, we have achieved stable detachment for tens of seconds, and uh, we're showing a discharge here where uh, the uh, detached uh, phase uh, lasted uh, about 28 seconds. During attached uh, operation, you get the heat flux going out as I described it before, um, but the plasma can go into a state where it uh, radiates away uh, uh, almost all of its uh, heat um, and uh, you can essentially not see on this uh, color scale uh, the heat flux uh, during detachment. And you see here time traces of uh, important quantities. You can see that the uh, radiation stays stable. Uh, you can see that the energy confinement time remains high. Um, it, uh, it has a, a little dip, but it, it kind of recovers. Um, and uh, you see the density is well controlled. You also see this little uh, uh, actually pre-programmed increase in density was exactly uh, what triggered the, the detachment uh, and the heat flux uh, dropped down um, uh, to uh, a much lower level. The diverter pressure, uh, neutral pressure uh, shows uh, actually an increasing tendency uh, the particle exhaust remains efficient, the plasmas uh, stay clean. Um, and this, I believe, is, is a discharge uh, that could have been uh, continued for much, much longer. Uh, it was essentially in, in steady state. But uh, let's not forget that uh, the results I'm showing uh, were with an uncooled diverter. Um, and so uh, the 30 seconds or so um, on the order of to a high, a longest discharge is a uh, 100 seconds because it was an uncooled diverter. You saw the, this uh, plot uh, in the previous um, presentation. Also, let me just point out where W7X discharges lie on this. This is um, a 5 megawatt discharge which had the, the record uh, triple product for stellarators. Um, and it's very similar uh, to the one that I showed you more details about uh, as proof of neoclassical optimization. This is a 5 megawatt ECRH discharge that I also showed you, namely the one that had detachment. Um, it lasted for uh, 32 seconds roughly, um, of which um, the vast majority was in detachment. And we had a low power discharge uh, that we uh, were allowed us to go to 100 seconds despite uh, the diverter being uncooled. Uh, we are going back into operation and we upgrade, have upgraded the device to actively uh, cooled components. Um, most importantly, of course, the diverter. Uh, this is a, a major undertaking to implement all this uh, water cooling. Um, but this will allow us um, to operate um, uh, for much, much longer pulses. 
Um, the cooling water volume that we have is finite. That's what dictates the 18 gigajoule heating per pulse. Um, but we can certainly expect that, uh, for example, this uh, the TETS discharge um, at five megawatt um, sh should be extendable uh, up to the 18 gigajoule, which would uh, mean one hour. And this two megawatt, uh, one could uh, operate for two, two and a half hours before reaching this limit. This high uh, performance discharge uh, was a achieved only transiently and uh, had some turbulence suppression, which we will need to work on to, to extend over longer pulses, but uh, we believe that we have the tools uh, to, uh, to be able to do that. Uh, because we will have major upgrades to both, both heating and fueling, um, we will extend our ECRH facility from 10 to 12 gyrotrons, and we have a program uh, over time to upgrade uh, 1 megawatt gyrotrons to 1.5 megawatt. Um, the ECRH system is uh, operating at the second harmonic at 140 gigahertz and is laid out for, for a steady state, in this case meaning 30 minutes. We'll be doubling our NBI power and adding ICRH, and we'll uh, have in, uh, the increased heating will be combined with a state-of-the-art continuous pellet fueling system that you uh, see uh, ha having arrived together with the main scientist, Jürgen Balzun, which will lead uh, to significant further performance improvements. We've seen that pellet discharges are the ones that have the highest performance and show some uh, uh, reduced turbulence. Uh, looking towards the future, um, W7X uh, has confirmed um, a lot of uh, expectations of ours, so we should be asking ourselves how a stellarator reactor would look based on this. The high field capability of high temperature superconductors, um, as demonstrated uh, so powerfully recently by Commonwealth Fusion Systems with their 20 Tesla demonstration coil, is a game changer in fusion. The triple product uh, scales like B cubed at the beta limit, or, or possibly even B to the fourth power, if uh, you believe that uh, the transport is, um, is gyro boom. Uh, so you will get a, a very substantial boost if you uh, add uh, more magnetic field to your configuration. So we uh, can scale up the W7X results that have been achieved to um, an ignited a relatively compact uh, one gigawatt electric steady state stellarator uh, by doing a, a factor of two in linear size of the plasma and a factor of three in B field strength. Uh, this gives us round numbers uh, that, to work with and um, uh, the predictions are that that would actually be uh, an operation point that is ignited, uh, assuming that the ISSO4 scaling continues and that the um, that the confinement continues to improve with magnetic field as expected. Uh, let me compare to ITER and to, uh, to the ARC, um, very compact uh, high field tokamak um, vision um, and plans for CFS. Uh, what I've done here is taken um, an illustration from a previous paper and uh, taken in, into account the uh, ability to go up uh, to higher magnetic fields than, than, than this one and scaled it down accordingly. Uh, this allows us uh, to um, come up with um, a vision of a power plant that you can see uh, optically is um, actually on the size or even smaller than either. In particular, if you think about what is the largest coil dimension, uh, the largest coils in tokamaks are the poloidal field coils, uh, which are necessary for uh, position control of the tokamak plasma. And this is also, you see in green here, um, the largest coils um, in, in ARC. Uh, the largest coils of a stellarator, even though this device is clearly um, much larger than this one, uh, also producing uh, more energy. The largest coil dimension, uh, which will be the non-planar coils, um, uh, similar to uh, what was the case in W7X, will be actually substantially smaller. Um, and this will allow us uh, to um, transport these uh, uh, more easily uh, along infrastructure, et cetera. As, as many know, um, it was necessary to, to wind the PF coils on site on ITER. Uh, so 
this is this very very much mitigates the uh, um, let's say disadvantage of the stellar being uh, less compact than an equivalent tokamak. So to summarize, W7X provides proof that optimization makes the stellarator an attractive uh, fusion concept. The optimi optimization to reduce neoclassical transport is successful. And I should add to this that we have new numerical results uh, pouring out um, in also in the, in the peer-reviewed literature that show that the neoclassical um, loss, losses can be further reduced, um, in fact, down to a level uh, that is equivalent to uh, those in a tokamak, or even the alpha confinement can be uh, on par with um, the uh, eater or better. Uh, that, those are new results that have come out in, in, in the literature in the last six month, months or so. Um, so W7X provides experimental proof that, that uh, neoclassical tr uh, transport reduction uh, through optimization is successful, but actually it's just the beginning um, of, uh, of that journey. We've demonstrated stable complete diverter detachment uh, with good exhaust efficiency, and uh, this uh, shows that uh, one, can, um, one can alleviate the uh, heat flux um, challenge. Um, at least uh, We've shown this up to up to uh, to five megawatts, and we're, we expect it uh, to be uh, further um, extended to higher heating powers. Also, because uh, we've we've seen that um, that radiating even a hundred percent of uh, of the uh, injected uh, power um, through an, an an edge radiation layer is uh, is stable in in W seven X. The preparations are well underway for steady state operation. Uh, the in-vessel installation has ended in December uh, 2021. Um, pump down and cool down was achieved in, in May. And we're still on track for first plasma operation for, for the fall of 2022. So, so there is much more to come in the next uh, few years. And the already achieved results uh, extrapolate to an attractive, robust, flexible reactor concept. So I believe that the uh, the future for stellarators is is very bright, and I thank you for your attention. And we'll now stop sharing screen. Thank you, Thomas, for sharing uh, the great results from Windows N Seven X with us. Uh, so as before, uh, please tap the questions in the chat, and we'll take them at the end. I see that uh, you all are putting questions and um, monitoring the chat and we'll make sure to go through those at the end. So now we go to the last presentation talk of today. Uh, please welcome Professor Ian Chapman, CEO of the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority. You're on mute, Ian. <laughs> yeah, I, I shared my slides too early and then couldn't work out how to unmute. Um, so good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever it is for you in the world. Um, I'm going to give you a, a very brief rundown of a few results from the first campaign of Mast Upgrade and then talk to you a little bit about the implications for uh, the spherical tokamak for energy production are um, prototype power plant that might follow master break. Ian, sorry, I, you went to mute accidentally. I don't know how. Thank you. I have no idea how I achieved that. Right. WebEx AI. This is this is WebEx. Yeah, I, I'm not used to it. I'm afraid. Sorry. Um, I thought I'd start with. Um, the UK government's position on fusion. They published a fusion strategy last year for the first time ever. Um, and this strategy has two, two goals, to demonstrate the commercial viability of fusion by building a prototype in the UK, a power plant prototype, um, and to establish an industry base which can actually build power plants. So um, we, we obviously, as the government national lab in fusion, are, are supporting that, that strategy. Um, 
as we go towards fusion power plants, I think it's worth stepping back and remembering what drives the cost to the consumer, which ultimately will be whether fusion gets adopted by the market or not. Can it compete in the market? Um, the the um, the levelized cost of electricity has a very strong exponent on the availability. So how much of the year you run, this really matters. And um, somebody once said to me about JET, that JET is a maintenance facility which occasionally operates rather than the other way around. And as, um, as people in the fusion community, we do have to get to the point of operating our machines most of the time, rather than upgrading them and maintaining them most of the time. Um, the um, the other things which which we care about as plasma physicists, as fusion scientists, are um, things like the thermal performance, which we've just heard lots about from Thomas. Um, but actually, the biggest drivers to the cost of electricity to the consumer are the cost of capital. Um, so, how much does it cost to build the plant overnight, and then how much does it cost to finance that build? If you look at where that money goes. Um, about a third of it is what I would call fusion capital, so things which are specific to fusion magnets, cryogenics. About a third of it is conventional capital. And then our operations costs, are, we, we need hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people to operate power plants, and so they're significant. The replacement costs of replacing the blanket um, and, uh, and disposable items like that are, again, significant, but really you're dominated by this two thirds overnight costs in the build. So what costs money when you're building power plants? Um, if we look at what we've learned from ITER and also what we would predict for power plants from systems code studies, you can see it's dominated by the magnets and the buildings. And to be honest, this is true, whether it's a Stellarator, a spherical tokamak, a conventional aspect ratio machine, in all cases, this is true. Um, so you see a very large fraction of the cost is driven by the magnets and the buildings that you put the magnets in. So this is really what drives the cost of the consumer. Um, and so we have to be cost, cost conscious about how we strip out cost. And that essentially is the genesis of the spherical tokamak. People were saying, well, can we use the magnetic field more efficiently? Can we drive down the scale? Um, can we put it in a smaller building, a smaller bioshield, and they will strip out costs from these very two, these two large substantial items. So the, um, the one of, the many challenges around spherical tokamaks is how you might exhaust the heat. So the boundary condition, of course, for fusion doesn't change. You still need the fuel to be hot enough to fuse. If you put that fuel into a smaller volume in the spherical tokamak, then the chances of damaging the wall are obviously much larger. So you need a, a clever way of extracting the heat from a compact design. Um, and that is the primary reason that we built this machine, Mast Upgrade, is to test uh, a novel way of exhausting the heat from compact designs. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Um, we're also using this machine to um, do some experiments which are of relevance to the conventional line and, and, and relevant to ITER um, and further expand the basis for um, future spherical tokamaks. And I'll talk about that as well. So what's going on at the heart of the device? We obviously have the, the core of the plasma is fusing in the middle. Um, and the particles are moving around the device, but the confinement is not perfect. So some escape and are swept down using the poloidal field coils to the diverter at the bottom. And this is a conventional diverter configuration. What we've done in the upgrade is to include a, a, an additional seven poloidal field coils in the diverter regions, top and bo bottom, which expand the, um, the diverter leg um, out in, in uh, radial space. This is about 50 centimetres. But in toroidal space, the connection length increases by about 20 meters. And the whole time the particles move in that diverter chamber, as I say, mirrored top and bottom, of course, they radiate energy. Um, and so that when they impinge upon the wall and reach the plasma facing components, the hope is that they have um, reduced in, in energy su sufficiently that we could conceive of a way of exhausting power when we go to gigawatt level plants. And how do I go to the next slide? Um, the other benefit of mass upgrade is that we have uh, huge flexibility by the introduction of all of these coils. There are 19 poloidal field coils in the device that uh, allows us to study a real wide range of configurations going from a conventional double null to an X diverter in double null, a super X diverter. So extending this leg around to um, the new diverter surface here and flaying the, the leg 
we can look at um, uh, a disconnected double null with an extended extended uh, leg on the outboard side, um, different configurations on the inboard side as well, looking at X-diverter and even looking at snowflakes. Um, and we can do balanced up and down snowflakes as well. So it's a hugely flexible device, which allows us to look at all sorts of diverter configurations. Um, the, the main ways that this works, you sort of saw this in, already in the video, is that the power is deposited over a much larger area. So you have a combination of increasing the, the radius for the target and, and broadening the scrape off layer width. Um, and um, the second primary way that we reduce the heat, which is impingent on the wall, is by just increasing the field line length. So the connection between the outboard midplane and the diverter targets, as I say, goes up about a factor of three in mast upgrade compared to mast. So these are really significant um, changes. It's not a factor of 10%, it's a factor of 200%. Um, and over that sort of huge increase, which really plays to the benefit of the spherical geometry, we hope that you can get a very large dissipation of the heat um, before through you know radiation and, and neutral particles before they reach the diverter. So this is what we were attempting to achieve. We made this prediction before we built the device. Um, it was nearly 10 years ago comparing a conventional diverter, um, as will be used in, in ITER, um, to the Super X diverter with a long leg and, and all of those um, dissipative losses that I just talked about. Um, this shows you the peak heat flux on the diverter plate. So looking across the diverter plate in a narrow channel, we see a peaking, and this is just normalized, compared to the Super X, where we were expecting at least 10 times reduction in the peak heat flux incident on the wall. Um, in fact, nearly 20 times reduction. And these were the first results that we got um, within a month, actually, of starting operation um, with uh, with long legs. Um, and you can see we really do see a significant reduction in the heat impingement on the wall using this long leg diverted design, um, which gives us a lot of confidence that um, that we can move forward with this as a basis for spherical tokamak power plants um, using using the benefit of this long leg. The, the other things I said that we would be attempting to do in MAST upgrade is to further our knowledge basis for ETA. Um, the, the, the key to that, of course, is that we must have um, plasmas which last for much longer than they did in MAST upgrade and get to steady state. Um, so here you can see uh, uh, now we're, we're well over one second long discharges, um, almost quiescent stored energy, um, and the green wall fraction beginning to saturate at a high level in this case. Um, so we're getting to stationary conditions and in the next campaign we'll be hoping to extend those pulse lengths significantly further. In principle, we should be able to go to five second pulses um, in due course as we continue to upgrade the machine. Um, we are looking at how the pedestal confinement and L behaviour changes. Um, you can see in the plot on the right that now that we have this, uh, this improvement in the closure of the diverter, we get a much hotter temperature pedestal. So already in mass upgrade, even with relatively low power, we now get hotter um, temperature pedestals than we did in, in all of the different scenarios that we looked at in mast. So you can see here a, a 400 EV um, uh, pedestal. Um, and we can also, using our in-vessel coils, look at mitigation of elms. So this is a very early shot, but you see the application of the RMP coil currents is causing a, a change in the L behavior. So that's something that we'll be looking at in great more detail with um, our range of diagnostics in the next campaign. We're also looking um, at how we might translate this to the future uh, for spherical tokamak power plants, um, extending significantly the um, breadth of parameters which are achievable in spherical tokamaks, um, particularly looking at the impact of stronger shaping and and higher beta as we would want in power plants on confinements. So this is a big, a big issue for us, and we will be more than doubling the heating power over the next two or three years. We currently have five megawatts of NBI power. We are currently installing another five megawatts of NBI power, taking that to 10 um, and, uh, and two megawatts of EC power as well on top. So we're installing two gyrotrons at the moment, both of which should be available in three or four years time. Um, we're also looking at, at access um, to density limits and how far we can push the density. We would like to be operating at a high green fraction in a power plant. Um, so how far can we push? 
and you can see the change from good confinement to degrading H mode and ultimately transitioning back to L mode as we continue to ramp the density. So we get to sort of 60, between 60 and 80% green world. Um, and we're trying to understand more about what sets those limits in spherical tokamaks. Um, and also we care significantly about um, the alpha and eigen modes, of course, at lower field. We activate alpha and eigen modes significantly, and that causes redistribution of particles and current in the plasma. Um, and ultimately fusion power. This is a, a big deal in spherical tokamaks, and we need a way to mitigate that. We have um, moved one of our beams to being an off-axis neutral beam, um, and the change in the distribution of the fast ions born from the beam, um, definitely we can already see that we can mitigate some of the, um, the uh, on-axis um, alpha and eigen mode activity um, by the uh, introduction of this off-axis um, distribution. Um, and in the upgraded heating power, we will have an intermediate beam position between the on axis and off axis, which again will allow us to tailor um, the distribution function of the particles um, with greater uh, with greater flexibility, which will really allow us to optimize this this behavior. Um, all of those capabilities are adding into our work to think about what follows that and uh, the, the the potential for spherical tokamak based power plants. Um, as I said in the thesis right at the start, the the aim of the spherical tokamak is to drive down the capital cost, the overnight costs of the plant, which we hope would then result in a lower cost of electricity to the consumer. There are, of course, many challenges from having a compact device, um, one of which is the heat exhaust, although the early results from mass upgrade give us confidence that, that we may be able to manage the heat exhaust in a power plant. But the, the compact nature of the, the centre column as well and the access for various services cause other problems, which we, we will need to find solutions to. As part of finding solutions to them, we are embarking on a prototype power plant design study for a machine called STEP. Um, the UK government have invested about 300 million pounds into this design work. This is now a, a national endeavor. It's not just UK AA. We have about 300 companies working with us on this detailed design. Um, the internal team is about 300 people now. Um, and continues to grow. So this is a serious endeavor um, where we are doing um, a proper sort of concept pros prospecting uh, around the spherical tokamak possible space now. Um, and the early results show that we are really reducing size. If I compare the, the emergent design for STEP with a radial build of about eight meters to the European demo design as, as one of very many conventional aspect ratio tokamak designs, um, where you're up between somewhere between 14 to 20 meters. Um, those designs, the European demo is nearly 17 meters radial build, and all of that build costs money. So you have very large toroidal field magnets, um, which require substantial cryogenic cooling, a very large cryoplant, um, and lots of strand um, and big vessel segments, um, all of which increase the cost. So the, the beauty of the spherical tokamak is that you can take out a lot of that cost. And as you can see, the radial build is less than half the size. Um, we are very much in concept design phase at the moment. Um, we will complete that concept design by March 2024, and we're on track for that. We'll then move into a detailed engineering design phase. Um, that will not be quick, and we're expecting that detailed engineering design phase to be best part of 10 years overlapping with some of the early long lead item procurement um, and the early infrastructure on site. Then the main construction happening over the 2030s, aiming to complete the build by 2040 before moving into commissioning. This, of course, is a very aggressive timeline, but it's always good to have um, ambitious aims. As, as a sign of that, the, um, the UK government are finding a site um, upon which step will be built and we are we will begin mobilizing before the end of this year on that site and start clearing the site um, we had 15 nominations which really spanned from the top of the country right to the bottom and east to west um, we down selected to these five this was the shortlist we made a recommendation to our department in the government um, two months ago and we expect an announcement towards the end of this year uh, where one of these sites will be chosen as the site for STEP. And, and as I say, before the end of the year, we'll already begin mobilizing on that site. Um, we're also thinking about the future target operating model. Um, UKAA, as you know, is a research organization. We're not well disposed to, to delivering very large programs of this nature. Um, 
So um, as well as us providing the fusion expertise, we will be partnering with a large technology and engineering partner and a facility construction partner um, to create a new organisation, which in the first instance will be a, a subsidiary of UKA, a company limited by shares, um, with two new partners and a very wide uh, industrial base using a, a large number of um, SMEs in delivering discrete work packages, um, but alongside two very large um, engineering primes. Uh, this we hope to stand up within the next two years, so by 2024. Uh, and finally, a word on regulation. Um, as, we, as we think about how power plants can be enacted in the country in the future, we also need a, um, a proportionate regulatory framework. The, the UK government have been doing quite a lot of thinking about how fusion should be regulated in the UK, um, initially sparked by a body we have called the Regulatory Horizons Council, who look at how novel and disruptive technology should be regulated. So, for instance, at the moment, they're, they're doing a study of drones and how drones should be regulated, um, or genomics. Um, they, they did one on fusion and suggested that we should take a proportionate pro-innovation approach, which is different to conventional fission regulation. The government then ran a consultation process on that. Um, and following the consultation process, they brought forward legislation into the House two weeks ago, um, one article of which said that they will be creating a new regulatory environment bespoke for fusion, so not using the Office of Nuclear Regulation in the UK, um, but actually using the Environment Agency. So treating fusion very differently to fission um, and having a bespoke tailored uh, framework rather than trying to use what already exists for fission. And I think this is a, a very important step that's been taken. So I'll, I'll close there and say um, the, the, the UK programme is, is in a period of rapid growth. We published our first ever fusion strategy, including, as I've just said, um, how fusion will be regulated, power plants will be regulated. The first results from MAST, and, and I must stress this was a short first campaign, have already shown some, some significant reduction in heat flux using alternative diverter configurations, which are very promising. The, uh, the next campaign is, is about to start, actually, so it will start over the summer. Um, we hope to be into um, plasma physics operation in August. Um, and we already have a series of upgrades planned, so nearly trebling the heating power and cryogenically cooling the diverter and various other, um, various other upgrades. And in parallel, we're progressing well with the concept design for what a power plant might look like. We hope to complete that in about two years time before we move into a detailed engineering phase with some, some large engineering partners. OK, I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, for sharing these important updates and pers UK perspectives. And uh, we are ready to move to the Q&A and panel discussion. I wait for. Chen Zhang to turn on his camera, if possible. Great. OK, um, so Ian, there is one question for you already, but we wait a few minutes till we, you get a few more. <laughs> so I'll, I'll work my way to you starting from East again. So we go to Chen Zhang and the question you had on the chat, I, don't, I hope you had also time to to look at them and uh, maybe you, you went through um, those. Uh, I'll, I'll go chronologically. So I'll start from the first one that I saw. There was a question on what is the limiting factor to make passes longer than 1,000 1, seconds in East? So this, uh, uh, for this uh, 1,000 second uh, uh, discharge is soft land uh, uh, discharge. So from this uh, point of view, we could see we can extend the path for longer. And uh, the plasma control might be a problem due to the integration non-linear drift. So the drift problem is uh, also one limit before to extend the plasma uh, duration. So, so far we tested the 1,000 seconds for integration. It shows the linear drift is a problem but at the beginning, but uh, I have seen in my talk, so we, we find the problem and uh, um, use the feeble sensor and this uh, linear drift was, uh, was very 
very low for long term division. So, uh, so according to our experiments, this nonlinear drift will be affected the magnetic uh, measurement and causing problem for real time reconstruction and plasma control. So, and uh, even in, in the future, if we extend the plasma division, I think this uh, uh, drift problem maybe also need to make more uh, some more jobs to to dedicate uh, the the drift. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can you ex? There was a question on if you could try to explain the difference between the conventional I mode and the super I mode. Yeah, this uh, super I mode it, it means general I mode and uh, plus the electron LED. So in this uh, this mode, uh, uh, this uh, discharge we can find that the uh, uh, near the center the the electron uh, gradient is very higher, and this means is on very good electron internal transport bar barrier with higher temperature, and uh, plus the edge turbulence barrier as uh, normally um, for the well known I mode just as a edge temperature barrier. So this we think uh, is a super I mode due to the center in electron LED. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think you partially answered uh, this question, but on what is the ultimately limiting, what is you ultimately limiting the fully non-inductive discharge duration? Okay. In the fact, our this uh, thousand second I mode has lower power injection. It has a heat, heat load and recycling or current drive was not a key issue. So, However, in separate experiments, we run high beta PE uh, with higher power injection, and this uh, normally is quite a little difficult to get uh, for non-inductive discharge, mostly due to the uh, recycling and the heat lot. So in the future, uh, we, for the next goal, we increase the heating power and uh, maybe extend the long plasma discharge duration. And this uh, this problem will be also uh, will be met and uh, should be resolved. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll come back to you. Let, uh, I'll go now to Thomas. Uh, Thomas. There was a question on when what kind of active control of the magnetic fields is required for uh, W7X to maintain the plasma position shape. Right. So, given uh, that the plasma uh, flux surface that the flux surfaces themselves are created uh, from the coils, uh, you don't need vertical control or uh, control of that sort. It really is a, a, a very stiff cage for the plasma. Now it's advantageous <clears throat> as we, we do have, we've minimized the bootstrap current, but there is a little bit of it left. It is uh, potentially advantageous for diverter operation to uh, change currents in, um, in the, we have a planar coil set uh, where we can slowly over time, tens of seconds, uh, change uh, the uh, um, the iota, the uh, the, the poloidal uh, versus toroidal components of the magnetic field to adjust slightly for for what's created from the bootstrap current. But fundamentally, there isn't need uh, in a stellarator for active control of the plasma shape. The only thing that does change a little bit is uh, the edge um, topology. And uh, that can be uh, then controlled with, uh, with, you can also do some current drive um, or changing um, coil current slowly. The, the amount that you need is really minimal. Thank you. So what is the nature of turbulent transport in a stellarator and how does this scale to a bigger device? Uh, so. Turbulence is a very big topic. Uh, lots of lots of answers to that. We believe that uh, the the ion temperature gradient turbulence will be dominant in a reactor, and it is um, also dominant in W7X. 
Um, so uh, how it scales to a reactor, very good, very good question. Uh, if we go by the empirical uh, results we have, uh, we can use something like the ISSO4 scaling, which uh, is um, somewhat equivalent to, uh, to the, the ITER 98 scaling, which is basically uh, a scaling for turbulent uh, trans, uh, or confinement due to, um, uh, due to the fact that turbulence dominates the, the transport. Um, so how do you scale? Uh, I think it would be good to have more uh, more data points on that to have a higher field uh, stellarator be built. And I should also say that the stellarator, uh, because of the optimization and the many degrees of freedom in the optimization, um, for over ten years uh, there are ideas out for how to optimize the stellarator to reduce turbulent transport. Um, so next generation stellarators will have that feature in them that the uh, optimization includes uh, lower turbulent transport. Uh, next, uh, what are the W7X plans for deuterium operation and what are the expectations on the isotope effect in optimized stellarators? So that's a, that's a, uh, a great question. Um, so W7X was laid out uh, uh, for deuterium operation, it's been conceived from the beginning as um, as being able to go to deuterium. We don't have the final uh, allowance for deuterium operation yet. Um, this will come within, let's say, the next five years or so, uh, hopefully, uh, and uh, we will then be able to address the isotope effect. What I can say about that is that. Um, LHD has operated with deuterium and uh, W7AS operated with deuterium. And they find that uh, the, the confinement is essentially the same in LHD between hydrogen and deuterium, which uh, you can argue it is a little bit of a, an isotope effect because the gyro radii are, are different. Uh, or you could argue it's not because the turbulence appears to be an the same uh, whether you have deuterium or hydrogen. Uh, so the jury is a little bit out on whether there is a, a going to be an uh, isotope effect. I, I think it has a lot to do with uh, things like zonal flows and uh, how, how the turbulence saturates. And this might well uh, lead to the result that you don't get a, an isotope effect in the sense of, of the uh, what I just said for LHD, that you will get roughly the same confinement with deuterium as you do with hydrogen, but W7X will be able to address that. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I move to Ian, but I'll come back to you too. Uh, so Ian, uh, two questions. <laughs> there was a comment first, I've noticed a significant smaller breathing blanket in step. So the question is, can you estimate the tritium breathing difference between EU demo versus step? And then there was a question uh, about is tritium self-sufficiency a requirement for step? Yes. Um, yeah, so we're, we're working on the, our design basis is that we need a, t a tritium breeding ratio of 1.2 um, because anything less than that doesn't give us enough margin, frankly, because that's, that's pretty optimistic anyway. Um, so we're, we're taking that as a design basis. Um, what, one of the benefits of the spherical design is that because the center column is so narrow, you don't need to breed on the inboard side. So you don't have to worry about getting coolants and things down the inboard side, which is quite hard. Um, so we can do it all on the outboard side where our, our preliminary designs for the blankets are, are of order a meter thick. Um, they have to breed all the tritium that we need for the machine. Of course, the volume of the plasma is much smaller than it is in a conventional aspect ratio. So in absolute terms, you... um, but yes, this is this is something we're very cognizant of and, and working hard on exactly what that blanket might look like um, and what multipliers we'll need, um, what level of enrichment of lithium-6 we need, all the same challenges which apply in conventional aspect ratio, to be honest. Thank you. Uh, and... A question on because step will be smaller in size compared to the other demo type device being planned. Do you see this as a limitation in terms of electricity production? Ah, um, yes and no. So, um, so step uh, as a comparison, as a prototype for step, we're designing um, a bit over a gigawatt thermal, which we expect to produce 
we're, we're aiming for confidently 100 megawatt electric, but but probably a couple of hundred megawatt electric. If you compare that with um, demo, demo is a bit over two gigawatt thermal, aiming for 500 megawatt electric. So it's twice the electric output, but it is a pulse machine, whereas a spherical tokamak would have to operate um, as a continuous machine. Um, we just don't have the solenoid swing. Um, and uh, and so the, the megawatt hours will be pretty comparable in the two, to be honest. Thank you, Ian. Uh, so there was a question which was with Thomas and Ian, but I think it can be posed to all of you. So we'll start from Zhen Zeng and then Thomas and Ian, can you can all answer. And the question was about these different configurations which were presented. And uh, so someone in the audience was asking, how important do you think is it for the world fusion program to have this diversity of ideas being pursued at the same time? Okay, so uh, I, I have not defined this question, which one? So the question is how important is to have the diverse, so, so many diverse configurations, like, you know, the one which are featured today uh, to be pursued, so research and developed at the same time. How important is this for the fusion community and then future fusion industry? So I look at this question, so yes do you mean the one thousand second discharge no i'm i think so the, i think the question is more about the configuration of the device as mm. a tokamak spherical tokamak conventional conventional tokamak accelerator how important is that the community keep keep keeps on uh research and developing different confinement uh configuration lines Thomas, do you want to have a go? And then sure, we'll come back. I, I, sure, I can say something to that. I think it's very important that we have more options open. Um, obviously, I think the Stellarator has uh, lots of answers uh, to, to the challenges. Uh, and that's why I'm working on Stellarators. Um, and uh, Ian has another approach that will allow the uh, power plant to be more compact, uh, will be easier to evolve uh, um, the configurations um, because it's it's uh, it's not as much capital cost uh, has some other other risks um, than 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 the stellarator. So I think it's very important that we pursue more than one concept. Eventually, we might end up saying there is only one solution that will outcompete the others. But it could also well be that uh, the market will want big power plants for certain um, markets and smaller, more modular ones for others. And a stellarator is unlikely to be a very compact uh, reactor, but it's going to be a very reliable reactor. And it's something that you can scale up if you want. Um, and so it has features uh, and it's very, uh, has high efficiency as was also pointed out um, by me and in the chat. So it, it will have its um, features and it will uh, be competitive in the market, but that doesn't mean that the other concepts uh, wouldn't have a chance. And I think this is, uh, it is important that we continue to evolve. We need fusion urgently. And um, we shouldn't just have one shot on goal. We should have uh, several parallel activities. And they will all, uh, they will also all to some degree benefit from each other. Lots and lots of the fundamental engineering and uh, plant uh, uh, components are going to be similar between the different uh, the different concepts, uh, so we can also benefit fit from each other. I would um, I would completely echo that as well. the The energy market is huge, and that it's not that there's one design of gas plant and one design of photovoltaics or one design of wind turbines. There are many in in all different bits of the energy market. And I fully expect that there will be a fusion breaks into it, many designs of fusion plants. Um, and that diversity is a good thing and should be nurtured. Um, at, the, at the same time, I just point out that I think we really should do more to reach in as the public sector, and we're all public sector people, we should do more to reach into the private sector and try and support them because the, the private sector is able to have a very different approach to risk than we are. They, 
they have to have a much higher risk appetite than we do with taxpayers' money. Um, and that can be a good thing, and we should leverage it. Uh, and I think that diversity is a really good thing. Okay, Chen Zheng, if you want, you can compliment or uh, you want to add anything, or we can. I, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, you can also try to uh, answer. There was a question on why do we need why do you need low recycling conditions in East? So, as a, first, I would like to define the low recycling. In our case, the low recycling means the recycling uh, uh, should be lower than the one. So this means uh, and normally the recycling the uh, 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 higher than one. This means the um, plasma density is difficult to be controlled. So this uh, in our case the recycling is about zero point nine. Is not so uh, not so low, but uh, it's quite lower than one. So this uh, is a low recycling our set. So, uh, for the other reason is uh, during the, our limited the uh, actually um, uh, low hybrid carbon driver uh, power. So this uh, also need uh, the stable uh, density and uh, also uh, make the uh, good the for non inductive carbon driver. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, there was a question I think here is more asking if you could elaborate on what is keeping you from running essentially always 1000 seconds uh, long pulses experiments. So this is uh, a uh, 1000 second uh, um, plasma discharge was you tend uh, from step by step. We, we try a lot of uh, uh, attempts before. So we from 10 seconds, 100 and um, to, to 1000. Okay, this is also with a solution of several issues from plasma control, coupling, and so on. Also, include the KD flux remove. So, in these experiments, several issues solved gradually. So, and also for the control system, we remove the linear zero drift by PFCs, and also uh, uh, plasma loop voltage. Is well controlled by uh, by the law about power. Uh, so, of course, this uh, is for this uh, this uh, one thousand second discharge with lower um, power injection, and in the future, and some other uh, other goals, for example, to to inject more power and also. Uh, edge mode and so on, and this is something should be also needed to be resolved. Anyway, we confidence for this uh, 1000 second discharge should be repeatable at this moment. Okay. Thank you. Thomas, uh, there are lots of questions for you and the accelerator. Uh, there's a, I think this is a very quick one. Tritium, tritium is not part of uh, W7X operation, correct? That is correct. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Move along. Um, so, how do you choose the right optimization for the Stellarator to make it a power plant? How do you? Okay. Go? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there are many different flavors of optimization, and even within an optimization, you can you can optimize uh, in different directions within that. Um, <clears throat> so, in the end, it's going to come come down to which which one will. Give you the most e economic power plant. So we need to build in to our optimizations a uh, a real cost function, if you will, um, so that we have a a basis on which we can we can choose um, which of, is the better concept. Now it they also have different um, risks associated with them, the various um, stellarator uh, flavors. Um, and uh, one needs to quantify that. And, and as, as Ian was saying, it's also a question of how much risk um, uh, is, is uh, acceptable to uh, those who, who fund the activity. Um, so, you know, I think that the, uh, the, the, the quasi omnigenous uh, configurations, the, the W7X line uh, has a lot going for it. I think quasi helical has a lot going for it. 
Um, Quasi-exosymmetry has some advantages. Um, now, in the end, one, one will either need to evolve more than one stellarator configuration, just like we have the, the various aspect ratios of the tokamax. Um, and, uh, or you say there is one that we will pursue because it has the best um, uh, outlook right now. Um, I, do, I think it's actually an advantage that there are so many possibilities for optimization in the stellarator space that we can find solutions for the challenges and have, in the end, we need an integrated solution uh, for, for all of those problems. Um, and, and the fact that you have many different um, possibilities uh, for optimizing the actual magnetic cage for the plasma is an advantage. That, and if you find one that's good enough, that will get us going. And maybe next generation will be a different flavor and be even better. Uh, what's important is that we we take this step as soon as we can and move uh, towards net energy production. And not, th not to say, yes, we found the very, very best uh, stellar optimized stellarator. It just needs to be so good that we can um, produce net electricity with it in an economic fashion. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Ian, there was a, there's a question for you that just came on the chat um, about compact fusion devices attractive, but neutron damage of the plasma phasing material seems to be more severe. What about lifetime of plasma phasing components and if the lifetime uh, of the material is shorter as compared to, I guess, EU demo? Yeah, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. And yes, the answer is it is, it is a, it's a complication of the spherical tokamak. Um, in the past, that has been seen as an inhibitor, actually, to a power plant based on a compact geometry. I would say that our philosophy is to think again about what are lifetime components and what are, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, disposable components. So if you, if you set up your geometry in such a way that you optimize the design for maintenance and removal of components, then the fact that they might last three or four years doesn't actually matter because you can you can get them out and replace them quickly. Um, when when we built MAST, we built it as a cassette, essentially. So it had a bottom lid, then an outer sleeve. We craned in the lower diverter, we craned in the upper diverter, we put down the center column and put the lid on. So it's not built as segments of an orange as, as you have to with a, a conventional aspect ratio or a, um, a stellarator. So the fact that you can turn it into a cylindrical geometry makes the maintenance much easier. Um, and you don't have big lifts going through complicated ports as you would do in, in either of the other two geometries. Um, indeed, that's one of the, the big, big hurdles with the, the conventional European demo design is how do you get blank? It's very difficult to do. Um, if you can make that cylindrical, then it's much easier. And then the fact that your components, your plasma facing components, for sure, they will get damaged and they won't last for 30 years. But if you replace them every three years or five years, it doesn't matter because the maintenance is easier. So uh, it's a very different philosophical, philosophical approach, not saying the materials have to last for 40 years. They don't have to. Thank you, Ian. Thomas, since we're on this subject, there was a very long question for you. <laughs> Let me try to go through it. Uh, so the question was, what will be the heat loads and at the diverter first wall for the one gigawatt electricity accelerator power plant, which you showed. And so how the heat loads compare with a tokamak compact machine like ARC? And then yeah. the question was, what are the current material considerations? Okay, that's a great question. It's right on the money because in fact, uh, such a compact, uh, powerful uh, device would be right at the limits of what you can uh, in fact i think its output would be limited by what they, the walls can handle now in the in the stellarator uh we have shown in w7x that we can radiate away uh, all of the energy uh with uh, uh at the edge um or essentially all of it um and this uh, this allows us to speculate that we could do that uh, in a reactor um, and if you can do that, you would you would actually be distributing the the plasma heat uh, onto your plasma facing components rather uniformly, 
and you would end up down at, uh, at, at one to two megawatt per square meter uh, of, of loading. Um, now, anywhere where that gets concentrated, you may want to need to concentrate this for, for uh, efficient particle exhaust. That will then get higher than that. Uh, but indeed, the 1,000 megawatt electric is, uh, is one that is going to be, uh, we might need to dial that down just simply because of power exhaust uh, issues. And to answer the question uh, of, of ARC, I mean, you know, I'm not an expert on ARC, but uh, this uh, vision that I showed is in many ways inspired by ARC. And uh, the same, same uh, I think it will be roughly the same situation in ARC, but they will need a radiating mantle to, to uh, get the heat uh, distributed uh, uniformly. Um, and if it, it really gets concentrated, one will have to operate it uh, with, with a lower uh, lower output. Uh, and and you were asking for materials. I think the the main material we consider is tungsten. We also have plans to up, uh, upgrade W seven X eventually with a a tungsten diverter, and get rid of uh, carbon in in the machine entirely. Um, so, uh, tungsten as a plasma facing component, but there are other possibilities. There are people who think about um, liquid, liquid metals, uh, a thin layer of uh, flowing uh, liquid metals. Um, there are possibilities that uh, can be explored, but uh, I think uh, tungsten is, is the most qualified uh, material for, uh, for first wall um, in, at the moment. Is that the case for step two, Ian? Yeah. Uh, Jin Zing, there's a question. I think you you mentioned what what's coming up for East. Uh, maybe can you talk can you talk about CF CFETR? CFETR is uh, yeah. So at the moment is just the finish the design and uh, will be and also have not yet approved by government. So this uh, CFETR is. Uh, I would say is uh, also we want to get the queue about from um, about ten to thirty, and so um, is a big machine and uh, I would say so. Uh, at the moment, we 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 are push this project. Uh, to 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 be built. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thomas, uh, I think there's a question about how the geometry, geometry complexity of the accelerator and how much would this complexity affect the use design of diagnostic system? Um, so I think I should start by saying that uh, if you look to the reactor scale, um, the accelerator being, uh, let's say, passively stable in, in almost every regard uh, will will require less diagnostic um, access than, than the more driven um, feedback stabilized uh, concepts. Um, and now it's possible we found on W7X, uh, we have more than 50 diagnostics uh, on the machine. Um, there are ways you can optimize the Stellarator coil uh, solution, uh, which actually has many degrees of freedom so that you open up space for ports um, and access for, uh, for diagnostics. Um, so it's actually quite compatible um, with, uh, with diagnostics. Now, diagnostics in general for a fusion power plant is, is, a, is a challenge all, all on its own, but I really don't think it's worse for the stellarator. In some sense, it could well be, be better because you don't need as much uh, active control. Uh, there was a, this question about, you know, you showed us all these great advantages of the accelerator mm -hmm. <laughs> line or the tokamak. So the, the, the question was, do you believe that the results produced by uh, W7X will bring more attention to Stellarator's line in the future? And I would add, if you could talk about the Simon's collaboration on hidden symmetries for fusion energy. Ah. Um, yes, I, I, it certainly deserves more attention, in, in my opinion. It, it should be thought of as the main or a main uh, approach to fusion. Uh, I'm, I'm really very, very optimistic about stellarators, I have to say. Uh, now, the Simons Foundation has, um, has uh, 
allowed us to make an international collaboration that has uh, been spanning over four years and has just been extended another three years. That collaboration has brought together uh, people from different institutions and from, from different uh, skill, skill sets um, working together on making better optimization codes uh, with, uh, with higher numerical uh, efficiency and, and more fidelity as well. And this has brought a lot of these results I mentioned uh, at the end of my talk, uh, for example, uh, bringing uh, the optimization of the neoclassical uh, transport down to the level where you can even argue below that of a tokamak. Um, and it's really had a revolutionary nature in, uh, in what we thought earlier possible for stellarators. There, there were things uh, uh, that we thought uh, like the stellarator is always going to have more more alpha losses than a tokamak because of the of the uh, inevitable helical ripple that doesn't look like uh, that's the case anymore. Um, uh, and and a bunch of other things that, for example, it was also said that uh, that uh, the uh, optimization used on on W uh, on W seven X is uh, is only. Uh, really possible at high fidelity if it's a large aspect ratio. Um, we have new designs. They're not completely mature. They, they haven't been optimized uh, completely for, for like MHD stability, but there are new designs that are much more compact and, um, and have very good con uh, particle confinement, very good neoclassical optimization. So that, optimi that uh, endeavor has really uh, been key in in making enormous progress, and uh, you can find papers uh, from the collaboration uh, in the peer-reviewed literature. It's really uh, amazing um, the results that are coming out of it. There's a question. Uh, there was a question about um, lower aspect ratios stellarators. Um, the question was. Uh, to what degree we can make lower aspect and we yeah. would want to make yeah. lower aspect ratio. Okay, yes. Uh, so I, I had mentioned already that the lower aspect ratio seems uh, much more possible than we thought a few years ago, where it, it seemed that it has to be somewhat large aspect ratio to optimize it properly. And that uh, does not seem to be the case anymore. Now, you may not want to go to extremely compact stellarators because you will get you would get some of the challenges that, that Ian's facing with, with his design, that you just don't have a lot of space for blankets, uh, that you don't, um, uh, and your heat exhaust uh, might, be, might be more difficult. Of course, Ian was showing us that there are, there are game plans for all of this. Um, and so maybe we can pick up some of those. Um, but, but it's not clear to me that a very low aspect, there will be some optimum aspect ratio. And it, uh, it is, uh, going to be a lower aspect ratio than W7X. Maybe it's five, maybe it's four, um, because you simply will be able to uh, produce the next step device or a power plant at lower capital cost. The same arguments that, that Ian was, uh, was bringing forward also are true for the stellarator. But to have it so compact um, as, um, as, 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 um, as mast, et cetera, that, that remains to be seen whether that is really the optimum for the stellarator. I, I kind of doubt it. I think the aspect ratio five, six is, is probably the sweet spot, but it remains to be seen. Uh, there's just now like a follow-up question from uh, Lorenzo Boccaccini. If you're in this optimization process, you're also taking into account technological requirements, such as sufficient place for breathing blanket, Solution for the vacuum vessel, uh, yes. or in vessel components replacement. Uh, uh, so, so this is a vision, I should say, and it, it it does not have a whole lot of details behind it. It uh, it has though been um, been made with the thought that the arc design solutions can be transferred to um, to a stellarator. That the the thinner blankets um, that they're going to be using will be used also in the, in the stellarator. So um, the, the vacu vacuum, in terms of vacuum vessel access, 
Um, Stellarators have built, uh, W7X in particular, built out of um, identical periods, which consist of uh, mirror image half periods. And so you can, you can imagine a maintenance scheme where you could swap out a half period for maintenance and, and pulling another one. There are other um, concepts that don't require you to have that, uh, that capability. Um, and there are still, uh, they still need to be evolved and, and fleshed out um, to allow for, for, for access. Um, so it's still at, at the, that those are all things that need to be, um, okay. need to be developed bef before we can say something. Uh, but there are good ideas and I think uh, there will be, we will find solutions. Okay, that's encouraging. Uh, Ian, there is a question about tritium availability, but I, I heard you said, um, you, so there will be, you're about to start the conceptual design phase for STEP. Um, is it something you already have like Tritium Field Cycle Task Force or are you looking into this? About Tritium availability? Um, yeah, as I said before, we, we, we um, as a de design constraint, we must, we must provide enough Tritium for our own purposes. So we're aiming for a TBR of 1.2. Um, I'm not very, I'm not especially worried about startup charge. I mean, there were sort of stuff in the press recently that was largely right, but not wholly right. <laughs> um, I would point you to, I mean, there are a number of scientific journals on the availability of the, the tritium stock in the world. Um, we, we published one, Michael Kavari from UK published one, it was best part of a decade ago now. Um, but it's, it's a really good article, which explains how much tritium there is and the decay times and, and how it would be used on potential projects and what sort of startup charges will be required. So it's not something that, uh, look, we have to pay attention to it as a community, but it doesn't worry me overtly. But we do have to get to the point where the prototypes breed enough. We can't just all be consuming and not producing, right? So so breeding is an important thing and we've got to design prototypes to breed. Thank you, Ian. So we'll take just one last question because um, it was about AI for Fusion and I should mention that we just launched uh, couple of weeks ago, a new coordinated research projects on AI for Fusion. I'm putting the link on the chat and it's open for applications. And so the question was, it could be for all of you, what role at the moment has AI, if any, if you're applying this, these methods in um, in your machines? And we can start from Ian, Thomas, and then Chen Zeng. Sure. So, so um, yes is the short answer um, and, and multiple different ways. So, as we get to systems code design, and one of the challenges of Fusion is that uh, to have a high fidelity systems code, which includes all the multi-physics, which is required for Fusion, is just hugely computationally expensive. So an alternative approach is to go to a, a sort of reduced fidelity emulator, but then put a machine learning wrapper over that um, so that you can, you can do lots of simulations and not require exascale machines. And uh, and have a sort of machine learning wrapper over the top. So we're looking into that and pursuing that as a potential way of being able to produce systems holistic holistic systems code design. Um, then in more niche areas like disruption control or something like that, you could well imagine applications for artificial intelligence or our robotics control similarly. Um, so we do quite a lot of AI for application in robotics um, and in control systems. Thank you, and Thomas. Yes, so I think actually AI can play a very uh, substantial role for for Stellarators. Uh, in certainly also for operation, we uh, we we have first results showing that the infrared images can be used to extract information about the magnetic topology um, with uh, with AI. Uh, but I think much more importantly, we uh, we will be able to, uh, as as Ian was also saying, we'll be able to. A proxy uh, complicated calculations uh, and speed up, and that is useful for the optimization and, and uh, will allow us to bring in things like uh, turbulence optimization. The, the turbulence codes are, are uh, of today are really too slow, but you, using either proxies from analytic theory or proxies uh, with AI is also under development, and this will this will allow us to have things um, so fast. There are only proxies, perhaps, but they can be quite accurate ones, enough to guide an optimization. This, uh, we also have examples of 
uh, MHD equilibrium calculations that are being proxied now with uh, with AI. Um, so it just has an enormous potential for for speed up. Thank you, Shenzhen. Okay, so I, I'll I agree to all of you. Uh, also, so I think the AI is very important for the Tokamak uh, simulation and the prediction and also the trainings. For example, the disruption, there are a lot of data and no way we use the AI, maybe we, it's, it's easy to, to know the interaction between the turbulence and so on and a lot of uh, physical process. So. I think uh, for the plasma good um, control and so use AI to 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 make a very very um, what is it very, very precise uh, modeling prediction and also use uh, for the uh, perceive control and the feedback control and so it's very important yeah great thank you very much uh, thank you all for joining us today, uh, and special thanks to the speakers. Uh, this closes uh, this session, and I should mention that we're already planning session three, and of course, the, um, we'll keep on having a diversity of configurations as uh, as already done in these two episodes. Uh, this the third session will try to be we'll try we'll try to have it sometime in September October. If you want to present results from your facility, send me an email and we'll we'll try to try to accommodate your request. So thank you again and see you next time. Okay, okay thank you.